be done without expense. Right. I, I really, you know, because you really can't, you can't build this thing at a, at a basis of money. You have to go straight to the resources and resource management to do it efficiently. You have to do it right, not with the price cost, excuse me, the cost efficiency, which will inevitably hinder you. So, I really can't answer that question. Pardon me. It was only in the system reference to the uh, I could do it on the case. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody on the right? I'll talk to you after. Yeah. Anybody on the right? Down the middle there? Yeah, over there. Uh, please, mate. Yeah. Brown t shirt. Uh, hello. Um, one of the problems I've found uh, in society today is that a lot of people have such short attention spans. So when I send them the link to this film and they see two hours and 40 minutes, they immediately close it and I can't, I can't handle that. You know? I can't watch that. Uh, anything that's more than three minutes long, they just don't have the time. Good point. You know, they're, they're too busy playing their games, watching their main entertainment, their X Factor, all this for nonsense. And every time you send, I, I have a lot of friends online that I talk to, I send them links, I show them these things, and they just simply cannot be bothered. What do we do about people like that? How do we get these people to see, to realise, to understand these are the kind of things they need to be interested in, and need to talk about, and think about? I think in communication, you just have to be more severe in your reasoning for watching the film. You know, one of the kind of uh, second thoughts that, well, inadvertent realities of the way the films are constructed is they're in sections. So I recommend maybe sending sections. Ooh, watch the section of the monetary system. It's you know, part, part two. And, you know, they, or, or if you know people that are interested in sociology and behavior, ooh, you're going to see the section of part one of the behavior of nature. I don't know, try to do something like that. I, I hear you. I made the film two hours. I could have made it much longer, by the way. I don't know did. Yeah, I almost broke it into films, but you know, I wanted to be as, as concise as possible, you know, not miss anything. I get so tired of people complaining about addendum and you know all that, because it just breaks up everything and doesn't explain it. Because, you know, it's, again, it's a two hour film. Um, it wasn't the intent wasn't to be forward based there, but moving forward certainly was. So I, I did that distinctly because I knew that I believe that you know, most people really do watch it. I mean, the four million views on YouTube, and some people have said they've seen it like. 20 times. I'm like, God, you really said that? You've seen it about eight. Well, <laughs> see, there you go. See, so it's, not, so it's not universal. So if you count people that simply don't want to take the time, I guess just move on and go to the next subject. You know, okay, thank you. Sure. Um, And that's why I ended it the way I did, is a very overarching aesthetic gesture, emotional gesture, a cathartic gesture. Uh, the transition is so unpredictable. There's so many things that could happen that would completely change the path, not necessarily the direction of where we want to go, but, but who knows what could happen and as, as the instability that's obviously showing itself now continues to go. So, I'm going to make more presentations in the movement and more documents in the movement. I've already I talked about it. I've talked about it in different contexts. But I do plan to make a transition, uh, narrated, simple, though not a movie, I don't have any music, to describe other you know, angles for that. Because the ability to dream is the, is the main, is the strongest and, and the main ability of the human Sure, yes. Thank you. It's a guy, guy in the middle there with a red top on. He's been waiting for a while. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I uh, just want to say thanks for a great film. Um, my question is just purely curious. Following on from that gentleman's comment over there about China short the information so um, I'm wondering, I'm sure you've been asked or if you thought it was possible to reduce the ideas in all three films into maybe 17 or 24 minutes. I'm talking about possibly doing a. <laughs> have you ever considered doing a TED talk? Something like that. I, well, I mean, well, all three films. The first film is its own little, its own life. It was before my interest emerged in this 
sustainable resource-based economy, which emerged at the end of the addendum. So there's kind of a divide between the three films right in the center as far as their context. Obviously, they're interrelated in the you know, corruption level and all of that stuff, and what the system reinforces and, and all of that. Uh, I have offers for TEDx I'm going to be doing. There's, there's different TED arrangements. Obviously, I will do my best in the 20-minute time frame uh, when I have those opportunities. And, you know, like tomorrow I'm reducing my, what usually is like a three-hour type of lecture to 45 minutes, which has been brutal enough. So, I'm doing my best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Dowling. Simultaneously, I, I've been able to condition myself to not feel like I am now responsible for anything. It's, I'm just like anyone else. And I say that constantly to people. As a founder, I'm an initiator. I'm, I'm not a, I definitely don't like the term leader, as you know, in my general rhetoric, because it implies that I have all the answers, you know. It implies or Jacques as a leader or anything. That we don't need leaders anymore. We need people that actually be educated. Leaders is a, is a corrupt concept. The, the leadership and and uh, well, leadership and peasant relationship, I can't think of another word for it. Leadership and public relationship is really power strangulation because the public can't be educated for leaders to be maintained. And that's why we have basically a dumbed down type of arrangement throughout the entire world and the restriction of information. Uh, throughout the dark times since the divinity of kings, it's been all about restricting information to the masses so leadership can remain power maintain power, and that's what we have to get over. So I emphatically want people to become their own leader, as I say, in other words, like Jiro Krishnamurti, who knew very well about that concept, and it's like I extend them. But I do feel pressure, obviously, standing here, you know, I have a tremendous obligation, and I, I, I am compelled to do as much as I can, and I do get dissatisfied if I don't feel like I do things properly and things like that, or let me down. And of course, everyone scrutinizes everything I say now. I, I can't make any statement without somebody, you know, anything that's slightly ambiguous will see some blog, taking out of context, and maybe do something on that for it, suddenly I'm advocating Nazism or something. I have to be very careful now with pretty much everything I say. So it does become stressful, I definitely admit that, but I also understand it, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed. I, don't, I, I, I take it in stride, but I, mean, I take it very seriously. But I, I'm not, you know, my blood pressure isn't that much more elevated, so I'm okay. <laughs> That's rubbish. I haven't had an original thought in my head since I saw these like last years. I can't get out of bed without him telling me to do something. <laughs> That's um, my water. Actually, the guy at the back here, I'll come back to you. At the back here, Jason, he's had with the cap on, he's had his hand up for a while. Uh, first of all, thank you for giving us those great movies. And if I ask my question, I mean, feel free to add anything you want to add and don't, but don't remember anything else. It's a great, great movie. Uh, my question is um, you raise the awareness gains about uh, population, growing population, but you, you stop short of, um, of uh, advocating any kind of uh, population control slash management standardization or whatever you want. To call it, um, and I feel this is. Do you think that we can have a resource-based economy while carrying on multiplying like that and like cancer in the planet, or is it that you want to put any kind of pressure groups 
by talking about, because I think that is the only point, uh, one little thing that I'd like to have seen more developed uh, in your films. Thank you. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry, I want, to, I want to make sure I understood the question correctly. You were saying that, that the subject of population, you were just curious how that fits in the equation? No, no, but uh, in a resource-based economy, they will solve a lot of problems. And can we carry on? Can we afford the luxury of multiplying ourselves? Oh, we are the cancer of it. So you, you talk about that, but you don't say anything about okay. a solution. You don't say, well, we should, we should okay. uh, control that for okay. evaluation of poverty, not for eugenics, of course, but any kind of solution. You, you don't talk we about this at all. Okay, I mean, we don't know what the carrying capacity of the Earth is. People will say, will say today that, oh, it's because of overpopulation you have, you know, one child dying every five seconds, which is complete nonsense. Even, even these global institutions like the World Health Organization will admit that there's easily enough food to feed everybody. There's easily enough technology to create desalinization plants to deal with the, you know, the water shortage and the scarcity <coughs> in the third the world. So I, I, uh, I'm of the contention when I look at what we're doing and how inefficient it is and what we could do if we maximize efficiency, I think the current population can multiply many times over, frankly. But that doesn't change the problem of a public that doesn't think about its relationship to the planet, which hasn't been the case. Through religious indoctrination, you know, go fruit, be fruitful and multiply, we've had this rhetoric throughout time, uh, dominant value systems and creating a family and such with no real regard for the environment that uh, they're bringing them into, understanding that each child needs the necessities of life, so they have the resources of the planet. So what needs to happen, to, first of all, totalitarianism doesn't work. Imposing rules on people simply doesn't work in the long run. So I would never advocate, because it doesn't work, any type of oppressive policy uh, for you know, some, some kind of population control or one-child policy. I'm against all of that. What I would say, though, is that if the public doesn't begin to understand its relationship, there will obviously be natural problems, which hopefully will resolve themselves by the consequence of, of what actually occurs. So, I jumped around a little bit, let me just say that in a resource-based economy, the educational system was designed from the very early ages. Instead of teaching people about Goldilocks and, you know, all of the play school, kindergarten, and preschool stuff, and all these the, the kind of mind-numbing things they do to children, which has which children learn extremely fast, and of course the young impressions are the most, most, uh, most permanent for most of the minds of most people, excuse me. You would teach them about their relationship to the planet. You would teach them how to grow food. That's the first thing you do with kids that are old enough to understand. You teach them what actually creates their life. You teach them about social relations. You teach them about how to live in a society, and what it means, and what the relationship is to the planet. So when they grow up, they might say to themselves, well, I don't think I might have a child now. Is the earth prepared? Is my region prepared? Am I able to support this child? What is the current state of the planet? Is there reason to suspect that maybe the carrying capacity of the earth can't handle any more people in the distant future? That's the type of rationale that would occur. And that's all you can hope for. If, it's set, if, if it comes down to it that population just irrationally uh, starts to continue to multiply itself, well, that's its own decision to, for demise. There's nothing that anyone can do about it. You know what I mean? The depletion of, you know, the fish stocks and deforestation, uh, that gives you an idea of not just consumerism, but growing populations impact on resources. Uh, I maybe we should address this, or we let me say what you just said in the film, so that skeptics, skeptics can, can at least understand your point of view of, of the zeitgeist movement on that matter. Well, I think I've more or less explained uh, the, the fundamental point of view and the resource consumption of human beings has to be related to the carrying capacity of the Earth when we finally figure out what that is. And people need to adapt accordingly just like you adapt to any other form of natural law. It's not out of the question. I really believe that the multiplication issue, this constant reproduction and expansion, is a result of early religious indoctrination. It's a to the Catholic Church and the dominance of Europe. I, uh, it, it, it's it, it, uniquely the most, the most, the people that procreate the most tend to be the most least educated, tend to also be the most poverty stricken, which is so bizarre when you think about it. Um, it goes to show that there's something going on in their, their sense of self 
that is, uh, it's distorted. It's, it's, not, it's not processing correctly what the relationship to the environment is. If I was poor and living you know, in a very destitute scenario, why would I have five kids? But yet, this happens uh, all, all the time. So it's an educational imperative, is my point. And that's all you can really hope for, again, is that people can understand. Ants, for example, I saw a beautiful documentary about ants, and ants are incredible. They will go in their huge formations, and they will consume a tree, but they leave just enough. They leave just enough to make sure they never damage it. There's studies that have done this. And they move around, and they have some type of consciousness that they never deplete anything. They never deplete anything. They know what they're doing on some base level. And I think somewhere in our, in our human physiology is that in, intuitive recognition that we live on a planet that has to be respected on all levels, but it's been completely robbed out of us, we can completely be coupled, because in the current economic model, the current global economic model, you have to keep reproducing. If you don't keep reproducing, no more money will be created. The supply, the consumption patterns will drop. I mean that very literally. If people stop for a period right now, the economy would fail. That's how sick this society is. And that's how why it's going to be so self-destructive and long run from multiple angles, because it's not based on sustainable. So the more the population grows, it's going to hit a peak. And the peak is not going to be real, it's going to be because the system can't supply anything else. It's just, it's not going to work anymore. And the saddest thing that I don't want to see, hopefully, my, that I don't want to see ever, and I, I, sadly, I think it might happen anyway, but it probably won't happen in my lifetime, is a depopulation because of a lack of resources. It's not going to be the new world order. Just throw that out there. It's a sick, the new world order shit. How does that even do? It's a it's going to be that because that the system can't support the people naturally based on the way it's organized. That's the fear. And that's the worst aspect of this entire thing. It's bad enough that we have the death and starvation on a daily basis. Already. We already have mass starvation with a billion people. And yet, everyone sort of looks a blind eye to it. Oh, it's just the way it is. Wait until it's two billion, three billion, four billion. That's going to be really grotesque. Really grotesque. And hopefully, it's, if anything, anything that will change people's minds about what's happening. Something like that will, as sad as that is. I, again, I don't want any of that to happen, but uh, that's, the, that's the pace, that's the trend that's emerging right now with this total systemic collapse. The population bubble will pop too if this isn't corrected soon enough. <coughs> this guy's been fucking for a very long time. Uh, people who are in like professional who, who, who 
work, you know, uh, uh, with up with, with this thing. Like in the press section. Yes, they would be translated too. Okay. I understand you. I mean, do you have these professionals? Oh, you mean you want a native professional? Yeah, that's a very difficult thing to assess, but I have to know who they are. It would change the movie explicitly because everyone has their own ideal communication. No, that's true, but then you, I mean, you would have you, it would be said that it has to be the same message, but in a different language. The same message about it. I don't, I'm not sure where, where I would begin with that to recreate the movie with, with <coughs> native individuals per... Because you're a producer, so you've done the movie, so you know whether you can, um, you can change the... Uh, you can put in the videos from like, interviews in the, in the country with the, with the scientists. Right, I'll, I'll give that some thought. I'll give that some thought. It's a very interesting thing to suggest. Though. And then, uh, yeah, 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 you, you can give that a thought on... on Okay, we'll be putting some money towards it. Okay. So, yeah, I'll move on. Okay. Send me an email. Peter at the subject. Good afternoon, Peter. Um, first of all, thank you so much for all you've done. Um, I have to apologize for one, but we have millions of people here. Um, uh, um, it's a bit tricky, my question. I know it's sort of been like in your views on the civil societies and conspiracy theories and the Illuminati and the world of all that kind of thing. Um, so I'm just going to go a little bit about it and think, uh, sort of try to place uh, the monarchy, the British monarchy. Unfortunately, I've noticed um, my own, if I can say, my own research. Um, but most people in London or in Britain believe the, the British monarchy to be only symbolic. Um, I completely go against that. Um, so I was hoping you could enlighten me on where, where will the British monarchy fit and the Freemasons in, in, in the whole picture. How are we going to get them involved? <laughs> okay, so you're asking if I believe in where the British monarchy fits. Yes, and we're going to get the, the, the Queen to go, come on, Structure depending on what the goal 
coal is and whatever region, whether it's irrigation. If you look at where the locations of the best geothermal power plants are, or the best wind farms are, you do exactly what you just described. So we have that program that we've been trying to get going. I'm talking more about a kind of real-time global map of resources that they were resources including people, books, cars, just if everyone could um, I, I'd, I'd quite like to start sharing resources with people now, and I, what I'm imagining is a community of people all around the world who want to share their resources, their possessions, so they upload um, where they are, what they have to this system, and then you know, you've know you got what I see as the beginning of a resource-based economy, and we can do this now, right? Well, that's interesting. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, I can look at maybe the face of some kind of arrangement because it's an intuitive, well, a crude form of way of describing it as far as general human interaction and what they're doing. So I don't know, I think that the program is probably already in existence in a loose form of what you're describing. As a, in your field, you should work to uh, um, I shall look into it. <laughs> Sub level. 
but it's really just the subconscious consuming things, comprehending things that our rational mind uh, is unable to do and, and explain. That's the way I would define intuition personally. I feel like it's more of a need to be, want to be in balance and want to be happy. Because you know? the world's not in balance, that's why we're all here. We don't feel comfortable with it, you know. So there's an element in us that wants to change. That's the point of character as well as the environment. That's what I'm saying. Oh, sure, no, I agree with that. I don't know. I just wouldn't say that's intuition. That's all. I would say that's the environment's effect on you. You know something's wrong. You know, people say to me, oh, I just know something's wrong. And they, they don't know why. And that's why I go back to the just, the example I just made, that there's so many interactions occurring around us that we can't possibly perceive. And responses that we do that we don't even think about, there's, we play tricks on ourselves. The mind is extremely fallible in many, many, many ways when it comes to the influences that are coming in and out of it and the biases of the individual. So I don't want to go along with the tangent on that, but I believe that when people say to me, you know, I just feel that something's wrong, it's not that it's a feeling, per se. It's that it's a perception that they don't understand why. It's a feeling that's there, it's a generative feeling, it's an intellectual perception, something's happened, but it's happened in a way that they don't think we comprehend it. And that happens all day long with all of us. You know, a lot of books I've read on how mind those tricks on you, the way you comprehend things, it's a fascinating subject. So, you know, but I agree, you know, yeah, something's definitely wrong. And I think many people are beginning to realize that whether they're conscious of it or not, you know. Um, this guy here has had his own book on this one. This one. Um, <laughs> uh, please do not disguise that, thanks. Sorry. Yeah, the guy in the <laughs> Thanks. <coughs> Just uh, two quick comments on the cost of a city. I think Portugal is aiming to do a TVP like city with a nervous central nervous system by 2015, and the estimated cost is uh, 15 million dollars. Uh, sorry, 15 million dollars. And another one of the population argument check the cap minded on door with a statistical analysis from Hans Rosling. Someone has good data on it, and how it stabilizes, gradually stabilizes to about. Uh, 9 million by 2050. 9 billion, sorry. I'm confused, million with millions. <laughs> <laughs> my question now. Yes, please. It's a transition. Uh, I, I know the focus of the movement is uh, getting the information on there and essentially making the value shift uh, in the culture, but I think when the city hit the funds, hit the fund, to be honest, uh, people would make, make something more tangible. So my, my question is, do you think that we could, uh, each chapter, as a parallel uh, action, get all the sustainability organizations together, like free economy, collapse net, or carpooling, and make it global uh, or chapter uh, level network of uh, you know trying to get the fundamentals so we have uh, some stable network when the, uh, when the collapse, uh, big collapse occurs. So, so bringing together about those organizations as more support you mean? Yeah, in, in parallel with uh, getting the information out there. No, absolutely. I mean, as long as the other organizations really understand the direction and willing to support it, if there's, yeah. if there's dichotomy, you know, I, people ask me all the time, well, <clears throat> why doesn't Green Digs work with you? Or why doesn't, you know, any other of the mainstream, so to, so to speak, mainstream activist communities? Because they don't understand the direction. They're not identified with it. They, I've had numerous communications, lots of establishment institutions. And what can I do with an organization? You know, a lot of people, a lot of activist organizations see the traffic. They just want to put one of their banner ads up. And they just, they're not really in the partnership. They just want to expose themselves. So as long as they're in line, but the, the Zeitgeist movement is this network in and of itself. And when I say to people in other organizations, I say, well, we'll continue to work with that organization. Why don't you come in and help support this as well as a secondary? And I think that's the best way to think about it. Rather than get confused, overlapped, with different intents, you know, and that, which I think can be very detrimental, I'd rather keep it homogeneous. And that's what I say to everyone. So they say, well, why don't you partner with this, this, and this? And I say, why don't you maintain that and come to us as well? That's a better way to look at it, as opposed to confusing people. And we end up with, you know, 20 partner organizations, and they all have their own little angles of what they're doing. If any organization out there that's explicitly interested in the resource-based economy that isn't of an ego disposition, because we've had this happen, where these sort of usurpers come in, and they come in at a very, very, very non-professional, very...